and one. Well, good morning, everybody. It looks like uh, some folks are starting to sign on to our stream here. Thanks so much for joining us here on WTOL.com and our free WTOL 11 app. Uh, as we continue to all really navigate this coronavirus pandemic now, a year or so into it, uh, it's our commitment here at WTOL 11 to provide you with the best and, and most trusted information. Uh, and this morning, that commitment continues from our team during this live Q&A with two local uh, health commissioners from Lucas County, Dr. Eric Skajinski, and from Wood County, Ben Robison. So uh, we really appreciate your, both of your time this morning and kind of answering our local community members' questions. As for me, my name is Tyler Paley, and along with our Amy Steigerwald and Brian Duggar, uh, we'll be helping to get your vaccine questions answered this morning. And our team is standing by behind the scenes as well uh, to share your questions with the health commissioners uh, so feel free to text them in right now. The number here over my shoulder, you can text them to that number. It's 419-248-1100. If email works better for you, uh, go to vaccine at WTOL.com. We'd love to hear any of your questions. All right, so let's get started. We've already gotten inundated with questions, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. So uh, commissioners, to both of you, this question is from Ian, and the question is, how will homebound seniors get the vaccine? Obviously, you know, as, as ages continue to decrease and more people become eligible, this is uh, a really big question. So who would you like to go first, uh, Ben or myself? Uh, let, let's, Eric, if you, if you don't mind going first, go yeah. ahead. No, uh, great question. Uh, unfortunately, right now, the, the vaccine that we have, let's just call it fragile, and, and it's very hard uh, to go to somebody who's homebound and give one vaccine and try to get to somebody else next door or down the street. So we're, we're gonna have to come up with some innovative ways to do this. Um, here in Lucas County, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out the best way to, again, get to these individuals. Uh, we're looking at strike teams. We're looking at um, ways to, again, transport those individuals from their homes to a uh, centralized location for vaccination. Uh, we're also hearing from the governor that, uh, again, there's going to be some other resources that are going to be put forth to, to help out with vaccinating homebound individuals. More to come on that. Uh, I think the biggest thing that we heard yesterday, at least I heard yesterday, was that uh, ODH is looking to uh, get some clarification on the ability to, again, move these vaccines from one, ho one home to another to another without, uh, let, let's just say, br breaking, uh, breaking the law with the emergency youth authorization uh, than when you can't move these vaccines uh, once they're opened up. So there's a there's a couple things there. I, I think the best thing to do for our, at least our seniors here, uh, Area Office on Aging, is, uh, is the platform that they should be contacting uh, to make sure that they can go ahead and get the, the most accurate information, but then see how we can get them vaccinated. Uh, so that's what, what that's, that's what Lucas County right now. Uh, thanks. And here in Wood County, uh, we're taking some similar approaches with our partners. Uh, we're connected closely with our Wood County Committee on Aging, as well as the Area Agency on Aging, which uh, uh, Eric just mentioned. Uh, uh, they have uh, lists of people who, uh, who receive home uh, meal delivery, and that's a good, uh, good indicator of individuals who may have limited transportation or may uh, indicate that they may be homebound. So we're working directly with those providers to identify these individual recipients. Uh, we're, what we're also going to be doing is working to uh, take uh, vaccine doses to senior centers and then bring people to those senior centers uh, directly. We announced on Friday that because there's so little vaccine available here uh, in Wood County, only 800 doses being provided to the county across all providers for this upcoming week, that we're going to direct uh, the Wood County Health Department doses in a targeted fashion to these senior centers and to other individuals who are homebound or have limited transportation. Uh, as, uh, as Eric mentioned, it's really difficult to uh, move or, or we can't move the vaccine once it's been, been transported out into the field. So we're working with our, our partners at Job and Family Services to make arrangements for uh, in, individuals identified by Wood County Command and Aging to be transported to the locations we're setting up, whether they be at senior centers or other community locations. So that if they do have to move uh, to uh, where we are providing vaccine, that they make that trip as short as possible. Uh, we're even willing to give them a vaccine uh, in the vehicle if that's the best option for them and to make sure that we're trying to work through uh, the identified individuals uh, and, and, and to ensure that anyone can access this vaccine regardless of their situation. All right, sounds good. Um, our next question is from Barb Rob Robinson. Um, and this is, has to do kind of with the groups that haven't been included in, vac in the vaccination uh, distribution yet. We're talking about, you know, how there's a big shortage of this vaccine. And, you know, it's something that I've tried to put into perspective for people is 
each time we add a group, you know, each time we add five years to this, you know, qualifications for, to get the vaccine, it almost becomes more scarce in, you know, in a community because we're not getting more doses in, we're just adding more groups of people. So her question is just wondering when they are going to give the dates for those younger than 65, example 64 or 60 to 64. Ben, you want to start? Yeah, so so right now uh, we know that in 1B that uh, individuals who have certain medical conditions will become eligible uh, on February 15th for the general population. Right now, individuals with certain medical conditions um, are eligible now if they also are connected to the County Board of Devel Developmental Disabilities. Uh, we'll have broader expansion of that on February 15th. Of course, uh, the medical conditions that we're talking about are, are um, uh, pretty impactful and will not bring in a, a broader group of people. So as of right now, in terms of dates, I think we are really dependent upon the supply chain to understand when we can expand beyond 1B. I mean, just as a, just as a point of benchmarking uh, here in Wood County, we, have, we estimate that there could be about 30,000 people that we think need to be served in 1B across all of the uh, recipients that have been identified. So right now, with, we know with 800 doses to date, uh, for this next week, it's going to take us a while to work through that that whole population. So uh, we're, we're anticipating that we'll get additional guidance. We still don't even know really yet uh, who is going to be in the next uh, prioritized group. And so we're we are I, we are working closely with our state health partners, and they are working closely with the federal partners to understand how to how to move this vaccine into the broader community from there. Um, but of course, what, what what we are doing here in Wood County, I'm sure uh, Eric will say the same thing for Lucas County, is just getting ready to have vaccine uh, capacity should should those doses increase. So that once we get them, we're able to move them to our community members as quickly as possible. So here in Lucas County, again, I, I just want to thank Ben uh, for all he's doing down there. A great partner to the south of us. And, and again, can't can't stress enough how, how important that actually is. Uh, here in Lucas County, we're doing much of the same thing. I want the community to know uh, for both Ben and my sake, but all health commissioners in the state, you know, we have really little control over these priority groups and, and how these doses are actually forward deployed. Uh, ODH, Ohio Department of Health and Governor, has um, has that responsibility right now through the federal government to be able to get those out. So we we really pivot quickly when we hear that um, another group is going to open up or we have to do something for the Ohio Department of Health. Uh, again, I, I want the communities to know that we do not have complete say over what happens. Now, with that said, much like Ben said, is we need to get ready and we have to plan for what could happen. We don't know what 1C will look like. We do know what 1B will look like here in the next week or two. Um, however, you know, we still need to make sure that 1B gets vaccinated. My, my, my hope is that we do extend the 1B for a couple of weeks because like Ben said, you know, they have 30 some uh, in, in Wood County. I know on our list, we have at least 44 that have pre-registered pre our notification system in that 1B group. And we know there's more out there. So we have a, a substantial amount of vaccines that still need to be given in the community for those people who even want it, let alone those people who haven't signed up quite yet. So I think the bottom line here is that pay attention to what's happening. We're going to get information as, as fast as possible. Uh, and we've, we, we've learned to pivot very quickly in public, health, in public health to make sure that we're doing what the governor wants, but also what our communities want. And I think it's important just to point out for everyone who's watching that one dose equals one person. So it's not, you know, like, so if we're saying 8,000 doses, you know, that's 8,000 people at the end of the day. Um, so thank you, Brian. And I'm going to ask this question to Ben, then I'm going to ask a follow-up question to Eric. Um, so Ben, how many people are wondered, wondering, of course, they're concerned about getting their second vaccine. So somebody asked, how effective is the first shot of the vaccine? Yeah, um, what we understand from our research is that we, uh, we know that after a little bit of time has passed, we expect it's about half effective in terms of those target, those target numbers. We're hearing right around 50%. Um, and uh, for the individual, it may vary slightly, but that's about what our benchmark is. That's why it's so important to complete that series, because as we know, uh, the population uh, uh, the vaccinations are really most, most effective across a population. And so uh, right now for an individual, completing that series allows you to have the highest benefit from that vaccine all the way up to that 95% efficacy mark after a week or two of that second dose. So it's, it's, it's so important for us to continue through. That's why we're so encouraged that the way these vaccines are flowing, as Eric mentioned, once you get in, uh, you have a chance for your, for your second dose, and that allows us to ensure that we can complete what we started. 
And Eric, obviously we focused on the nursing homes first. So my question is what kind of success are we seeing in the nursing home? Are we seeing the case numbers come down? Are people apparently being protected at this point? Yeah, we are, we are not seeing the numbers like we have. We do have sporadic outbreaks, if you would, in those nursing homes, um, but it, it's nothing like we were seeing before. Uh, the, so the vaccines to me are helping, but I, I think too, we need to understand too that those, those other barriers that we attempt to use, uh, the hand washing, the, 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 the mask wearing, you know, the, the staying away six foot or more, you know, those things are also in place and that's helping as well too. Um, you know, I, I wish that um, at least in public health that we had a, a better handle on um, long-term care facilities and the vaccination process. But again, that came really from the federal government uh, through local pharmacies to push those out. Uh, so uh, again, that's the, the inability for us to get real-time data uh, in public health is a concern because again, we can't really help our community out when we don't have those, those numbers right away. It, so they trickle in. So that's always difficult. So, but the, the idea of getting as many people vaccinated in long-term care facilities, that is what we really need to message out and strive for. Uh, so uh, I, again, I do think that it's helping out. I, we're not seeing the cases that we have in, in the past and let's just hope that continues. Yeah, I think that's really important. And I know nursing homes was was a topic of conversation for Brian and myself early on in this pandemic because it was clear that the outbreaks were so prevalent there uh, early on. And, and clearly, you know, that hasn't changed a whole lot. I do want to just recap for folks just joining us. Um, thank you so much for joining us. This is our live Q&A with the Wood and Lucas County Health Commissioners. Really important information getting out to folks. I know so many of you, including us, have so many questions about this vaccine, the pandemic in general. Uh, so this is your chance to really get these questions uh, answered straight from the source. So please text them to us. The number's right over my shoulder, as well as on your screen. Email them to us. We'd really like to get to as many as we can. I do want to get to the next one. Uh, this is for uh, Eric, because this is uh, from a one of the folks you serve here in Lucas County. Her name is Rita. And she's asking about uh, the effects with other medication. Her question is, is there any known effect if you're on medication? Because she takes about 12 or so different ones. Should she be concerned as far as getting vaccinated? All right. So anytime that I get this question posed to me or something along those lines, you really need to check with your doctor. It's really important to make sure you're talking with him or her uh, to make sure that none of those drugs or the things that you are doing in your life for treatment actually will, will hinder you from getting the vaccine. Probably not, but again, it, it's really important to have that conversation with your doctor. Um, you know, there, there, there are just so many things out there that are variables that, you know, even when we're at the, the, the pod site, sometimes we're going to have to reach back in the doctor as well, too, to get, to make sure that again, that individual can get vaccinated. So again, anybody out there that has a question about what they are taking relative to their, to their daily regimen of pharmaceuticals, if they have a question, make sure they get to their doctor and have them have that conversation to make sure you're all on the same page. All right, I'm going to move on here, um, and this is more so to, pertaining to Lucas County, from what I understand. Uh, we were just talking a little bit further back just about how scarce the vaccine is, and ultimately, some of the problems people are experiencing may not exactly be scheduling problems, uh, but they might just be, you know, a lack of doses, a scarcity problem, and you guys just don't have any left to give out. But want to kind of pose some of the questions we've been receiving about scheduling in particular. Really? Um, do, 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 where'd they go? Oh, Roy Davis, he is 71 and he's in Lucas County. He said he signed up or registered, you know, pre-registered saying he was interested in January and hasn't been able to make an appointment. He wasn't notified at all after signing up. What should they do now? We have another one very similar from Scott Barton. My mother is 80. She is registered. She hasn't been contacted and she lives in Lucas County. So just walk us through, I guess, the process. We can go to uh, Lucas County first, and then we'll also go to Wood County. Um, just about, you know, what, what you should do, how you, and if you are going to be contacted, if you should reach out again when you become eligible, what exactly does that process look like for people? So uh, a, a couple things. Let, let's uh, let's peel this back a little bit. First off, yes, uh, there are limited doses. Uh, you know, every Thursday we open up a, a, a new set of schedules. Uh, last week, uh, I did my press conference. So I, I announced some things. We took questions. By the time I got out of that uh, press conference, several of the sites were already filled, and that was a uh, you know, hundred or, or so uh, schedule slots. So they they go fast, and that really truly is a relationship of the limited amount of doses we have to give out at this point in time. Hopefully, that begins to open up come end of March and April that we we don't have to worry so much about that. 
Now, the pre-registration notification um, process that we asked everybody to kind of work on uh, in January, sign up for, uh, please check your spam. It, it appears that uh, some people's uh, spam, uh, actually that's where that email goes. So, so check that we do send out uh, weekly notifications of what's going on. Also too, I mean, it's really important that everybody pays attention to the media. Uh, you know, you guys hear this is what you what you do and you're doing a great job. But, you know, every Thursday, at least in Lucas County, we're going to announce uh, another set of, of, of schedules that are opened up. Uh, the, the problem that we have, too, is just the, the mechanism right now uh, to, to actually get those those schedules. Um, you know, you got to go to a link. So you go you, you what we try to do. Excuse me. What we try to do in Lucas County is make it extremely easy. What we could have said was, OK, everybody you're on your own, you know, hospitals, you, you have your own link, you know, uh, pharmacies, you have your own link. But what we wanted to do is make this as easy as possible in the situation that we're giving. So on our website, we have everybody listed, not only us who are giving vaccines, not in the hospitals, uh, but the FQHCs, the, you know, the, the CVSs, the, the Walgreens, we have everybody listed. So it's a one-stop shop, but unfortunately, it's not a true one-stop shop. Because if, it, if, if I had my, my druthers, we'd have everybody schedule all on one sheet, everybody, CVS and everybody else, that people can click into and get their appointment. But let's face it, that's not going to happen uh, in the world we're, we're in today. Uh, so what we have is we have what we have right now in Lucas County with the links. Um, so uh, do, do me a favor for those individuals who just asked the question. Uh, just go ahead and, and continue to get, to get on our website. Uh, try to make sure that you're, you're, you're getting on to one of the links that might have a, a, a schedule open. Um, and we're going to be opening more, um, more slots this Thursday. So uh, again, pay attention to the news. And, and at that point in time, hopefully we can get you in. In Wood County? Yeah, I'm just going to echo Eric's comments there. You know, we, we likewise are listing all of our providers in Wood County as well. But exactly to his point, uh, we don't have the ability to schedule directly into those providers. So some of these providers like a Walgreens or a Kroger are national providers. And so they're trying to create umbrellas that can uh, create a, a vaccine appointments, not just here in Wood and Lucas counties, but throughout the whole nation. And so we're a little bit at the mercy of, of the systems that these large providers have put in place. But you can find information there on the Wood County website. You can also call our number, uh, 419 Three five two eight four zero two, and listen for options. Whether you have access to a computer or not, you can navigate that phone system to hear about providers who have vaccine or to schedule appointments that, that can be scheduled directly through that, that phone system. So there, th this is an ongoing challenge for us. We, uh, we likewise are working with our Wood County Committee on Aging. We do get people who are looking for vaccine and as we get their information, they become members of, of kind of an on-call list. Um, and there are opportunities for us to call those, those individuals to make them aware of appointments. But unfortunately, uh, we don't have a lot of those opportunities arise. So we want to encourage people every week to check back. Um, here in Wood County, we release appointments about noon on Friday of the ones that we know, at least those that we can control, um, as, as Eric is aware of too. We don't have a lot of say on some of the big providers, but those here at the county level, we release about noon on Friday. Um, you can find them there on our webpage or by calling that number. Um, and, uh, and then also, uh, you know, we just want to continue to work through the numbers that we have. So if, if you provide your information, please keep checking back because vaccine appointments may become available more quickly than we might reach out to you. Um, but we do have a few occasions here and there where we can uh, get people connected with vaccine unexpectedly. And that's a good thing for us. It's a good thing for them too. Hey, Eric, we hear about this a lot. You know, some people are afraid of taking the vaccine. So Mary Ann of Lucas County asked, you know, what are some of the big side effects of the vaccine? And what if you have severe allergies? So uh, again, uh, if you have severe allergies, talk to your doctor, uh, make sure that uh, again, you can safely receive the vaccine. They're gonna be able to tell you what you should or should not do. With that said, let, let's talk a little bit about what we, what we could expect. Um, I'll tell you too, what I've seen uh, from my staff who have received the vaccine um, and, or, or, and or myself or others in the community. So, you know, again, any vaccine that you're getting, whether it's the flu vaccine, tetanus or whatever, you're going to have some reaction and that's good. Um, so I liken the, the first shot for most of us uh, as a, it's even a little bit worse than tetanus. I, I, I excuse me, a little bit better than tetanus, excuse me, a little bit better than tetanus. Uh, my tetanus shot hurt last time. Uh, this one did not hurt as much, uh, the COVID one. Uh, so again, you're going to feel some pain in the arm. Uh, you know, I had one individual in on staff that had a little bit of a red spot. So again, these are some of the, the, the issues that we had um, with the first vaccination. Now, the second one, 
um, some of us had a little bit more severe reaction to it. It wasn't real bad. Got a headache, uh, you know, um, you know, you ached a little bit, but again, that's showing that 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 vaccine is actually working. Um, so I liken it to um, a, a very a very mild flu shot that I've gotten in the past because I've had those same reactions. Now, I, 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 let's be very transparent. Not everybody reacts that way. Um, I've had a couple. Um, I've had a couple employees that um, had some severe reactions uh, in, in the sense that they just felt blah for 48 hours and, and they, they, they just had some aches and pains. Uh, and some people will have that. But again, that is showing that the, the vaccine is working. Um, the, the, the idea of the being uncomfortable for, you know, for a day um, really does uh, outweigh the, the possibility of you getting COVID and, and ending up on a vent or passing it to your grandmother. So uh, again, the, the, you got to really out, you got to really look at the uh, the issues that you might have, because everybody has a reaction to a vaccine, but then coupled with the the severe concerns you could with COVID. So again, my reaction, um, you know, like I said, my tetanus shot was worse last time I had it than than the COVID vaccine. And Ben, let me ask you this: so you are actually asking people to stick around what 15, 20 minutes after they get the shot, right, to see if there's any type of reaction? Yeah, so across all providers that are giving vaccine, you're going to be asked to wait at least 15 minutes. But if you have a history of allergies, uh, potentially up to 30 minutes, uh, provided that, is, as Eric mentioned, your, your allergist or your uh, primary care physician is indicating that you, that you are eligible to be vaccinated. So um, the reason for that is that we have some research now that, that indicates that those are good wait periods to uh, identify a severe reaction if that's going to happen. And when I say severe, I mean an anaphylactic reaction that could be life-threatening. Um, by, by keeping that waiting period in place, it gives us an opportunity to identify that early. Early intervention reduces the possibility of long-term or, or potentially uh, you know, permanent impacts on, on an individual. And every location you're going to go is equipped with the resources they're going to need to intervene. The epinephrine and the, the medical personnel who can help you to, uh, to respond should you begin to have a severe reaction. Up until now, this is exceedingly rare, which is really good information. Um, looking at this, the research that was just released uh, for the Pfizer vaccine, about 11 cases of anaphylaxis over a million doses, and only two and a half uh, cases of anaphylaxis uh, for a million doses of Moderna. So really good numbers for both of our vaccines. And so for most people, it'll just be extra time. But for your planning purposes, I would assume that you should probably plan for 45 minutes to an hour for your vaccine uh, appointment. That way you have time to work through any paperwork that might be there, get to your seat, go through the screening process, complete whatever waiting period you need to do, and then be back on about your day. So if you're thinking it's like your flu shot, you show up for five minutes and you're out the door, um, that's not going to be your experience here. We want to make sure people are safe and keeping you around helps us to ensure that. So far, some really important points made uh, as we near the halfway point of this. Uh, again, if you're just joining us on live Q&A where we're answering your questions, text them to us, email them to us right now. We have our team standing by to, to get you answers straight from the Wood and Lucas County uh, Health Commissioners. Uh, so really important information getting out of there this morning. My next question, uh, I want to start with you, Ben, on this one, because uh, this question is a big one that we've been getting. Can you get a vaccine in Wood County if you don't live there? Some folks live right over the border or work in Lucas County, Monroe County even. What's the deal with where they should get vaccinated? Yeah, thanks so much for the question. We've gotten this question a lot too, as you can imagine. So we recognize that here in Northwest Ohio, our communities are interconnected. And so we, we also understand that immunity in Wood County benefits Lucas County and vice versa. So we are not putting residency restrictions on, where, uh, on people's access to vaccine, just the same eligibility requirements that the state has released. And we think that this partnership is gonna help, to help us to ensure that we're serving people effectively and also uh, leveraging these, these resources uh, in, in a partnership way. I can tell you that we have a number of partners here in Wood County, uh, let's say churches or, or other community organizations, whose footprint doesn't, doesn't stop at the Wood County border. So, you know, county agencies are sort of unique in that way that we go to the county border and then pretend that nothing exists either north or south of the river. But of course, we know that that's not the case. And so uh, by, by, uh, by engaging our communities where they operate, I think we have an opportunity to serve our, our populations more effectively. So, you know, we have a great, great partnership with Lucas County and, and certainly the V Project has highlighted the fact that we are working together across Northwest Ohio. And so as we move forward and, and additional vaccine is available, I think you're gonna see even more opportunities where we're doing uh, joint efforts with these providers that have, have uh, a multi-county footprint. All right. If you don't mind, Eric, if you 
I'm sorry, Amy. I just want Eric to kind of follow up if that's similar for Lucas County. Yeah, you know, it, it definitely is. Uh, you know, again, I'll just use Perrysburg. I know that we vaccinate individuals, you know, from Perrysburg. Again, you know, the, the, the planning issue is the only concern that I think that any of us have. You know, we know that we'll get X amount of doses. Uh, you know, we, we do we do want to make sure that, you know, residents from Lucas County and Wood County and, and all over North Ohio get vaccinated. But uh, again, we, we just want to make sure that, you know, as our planning efforts go forward, we understand that we are going to have to share uh, individuals coming across borders either way. Um, and as long as we know that, it, it, it's, it's, it's much easier than to actually get your systems in place and the process in place and get people vaccinated. All right, next question. I mean, this is kind of an interesting one that I personally didn't even think of, but now that, you know, things are happening, it is a valid question. A lo local health departments, this is from Linda Pope, by the way, and local health departments don't resend emails to get the second vaccine. So how are we to get scheduled for that? So a lot of people have been asking, okay, it's so hard to get an appointment right now, but let's say I get one. How do I know that I'm gonna be able to get that second shot? Because we know that, you know, getting both is, is you know, needed yeah. in order to protect yourself against this. So talk about, hey, you know, you get the vaccine, great. How do I schedule that second appointment? Well, I'll start and then, then, then Ben, if you would. So the system that, again, if you're using, you know, one of our hospitals here or using our health department, uh, we're sketching through what they call an acuity system. And so, you know, you, you, you take the time and the effort and sometimes the struggle to get that first appointment uh, that now puts you into our system. You get an email uh, telling you to come for your first vaccine. Uh, we tell you then to return to that vaccination site 21, 28 days later, depends on if it's Moderna or Pfizer. Uh, and then uh, our system too will, will, will send out a reminder to you as well to say, listen, you, you need a vaccine. So uh, again, that's how we're working it. However, again, I, I don't know what CVS is doing or Walgreens or, or, or other entities that are giving out vaccines. Uh, so I, I think that the system, again, no system is perfect, but I, I think our, our system um, suffices well to, to make sure we get that second vaccine. And, and I really do want to stress this to the community. At this point in time, you know, the way that we operate, you get your first dose, your second dose has your name on it, and you will get that second dose uh, with, with our current guidelines and our current standards. Uh, so I, I want people to understand that. You get your first dose, your second dose is already sitting in a freezer someplace ready for your, for your arm on 21, 28 days later. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just echo Eric's comments there. So really getting in to that first dose is the, is the first big challenge. Once you've gotten in, then we want to make sure you complete your series. And so uh, we have second doses earmarked for, uh, for the places that have used them for their first doses. And here in Wood County, our providers are scheduling that second dose uh, uh, right there at that appointment. So that's usually the latest that, that, you're, that you're going. So if you get there for your appointment, you're going to have an opportunity usually at that time to have your second, uh, a second shot set up at that point here, here at the health department. That's exactly what we're doing. And we're hearing the same thing from our providers as well. So some providers, if you look at the national providers, even allow you to schedule your first and second dose at the same time. And, uh, and we are encouraged. I will say this, there's been some updated guidance. So now uh, you have the 21 or 28 day waiting period. Uh, whether it's uh, 21 days for Pfizer or 28 days for Moderna. Um, but now you can get your second dose uh, up to four days earlier than those two timeframes or up to 42 days later, which is a lot more flexibility than we, we originally had. So that's encouraging. So if you, for whatever reason, miss that window for, for whatever the reason might be, there's a little bit of opportunity to follow up. But of course, we want to get you in at that ideal time frame, 21 or 28 days later, if, if at all possible, and, and get that immunity building to that 95% target, target uh, level. Yeah, and just for the people who may have just hopped on, um, you know, with questions surrounding scheduling, um, everything starts at the health department website. So go to, you know, whatever county you are going to to get vaccinated, check out the health department's website, and there will be more specific instructions right there on if you should call, if you should make the appointment online. It does differ from county to county, but everything kind of starts there for both Lucas and Wood, and from what I've uh, researched, other counties as well. So. Brian. A Amy, could, could I just follow up real quick? And, yeah. and, and Ben's 100% right. There's some new guidance. But here in Lucas County, uh, we're still hearing the 21, 28 day time frame. And, and, he and here's why. Uh, because it is so limited, uh, just because your dose is earmarked during that 21, 28 day time period doesn't mean that I'm going to have it a week later. Uh, because if you don't show up, I'm using it for, you know, for an 80 year old who showed up to my clinic. 
Um, and, you know, unfortunately, with a limited amount of dosage, uh, I cannot guarantee you to be vaccinated outside that time frame. Hopefully we can. Uh, but again, I just want to make sure if you're coming to one of our Lucas County sites, really, you need to be there 21, 28 days. Um, just because I cannot guarantee we're going to have doses after that. Yeah. And I've heard, um, you know, for anyone who knows me personally, my mom is a nurse um, and she has been, you know, administering this vaccine for people. And it's so important, she says, to show up on time when you are scheduled, because it is ultimately, you know, it could be a matter of minutes where that vaccine just kind of, you know, goes bad because it's out of the freezer for too long. So really, if you do get an appointment, showing up on the right time, the right day is in your best interest. A Amy, please, just one, I'm sorry, one last thing. Relative oh, to our, again, uh, Ben's 100% right. You know, you could be there for 45 minutes a little bit longer, depending on your situation. Uh, we usually get people out within 30 minutes, and 15 minutes of that is actually the wait time. However, um, and, and I think that people are seeing these long lines uh, for three hours in, 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 other, in other cities and in, in other states. Um, we're not doing that. Uh, if you have an appointment for 10 o'clock, um, you don't need to show up at eight. Uh, we're, we're, you know, show up 10, 15 minutes early, that's fine. Uh, but again, you know, we, we see hundreds of people, you know, in line at eight o'clock when their appointment's not until 9, 30, 10 o'clock. So uh, again, just, just bear with us and, and show up close to your, 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 your time for your schedule. Uh, we don't need you there an hour early. We really don't. We don't need any camping out. Sounds good. No, no you don't, you don't. Um, ben, this question comes from Ted Zelinski. He says, when I get my second vaccine, will I be able to get together with friends and play cards and socialize as long as I mask up and wash my hands? So th this is the question that, that we keep getting is, is what freedom comes with uh, completing your vaccine series? So certainly we are encouraged by uh, the, the individual immunity targets that we're hearing about. The 95% is about as, as good as you can get for a vaccine. So that, this, is, this is great uh, work by our researchers and our scientists. Um, but what we understand is that those guidelines are still going to be in place. So the things that we're encouraging people to do uh, to still maintain their distancing, still keep their their gatherings low, uh, maintain that spacing that we have, wear the mask, that's all gonna be really important because as I mentioned earlier, vaccines really have their best benefit at the population level. And while an individual may be protected uh, at the population level, there's still the possibility the vaccine, uh, uh, that, that the virus could still move across the population. Additionally, there are some questions that are out there because this is new new vaccine, we don't know exactly what an individual's ability is to spread the virus. So we, it's possible the, the vaccine will protect them from developing disease, but they may still be able to transmit to others. And so until we know more about this and just have a, a, a greater benefit community-wide, we want, those, we want those, uh, those uh, guidelines to stay in place. You know, as we've been saying all along, and, and uh, we keep saying this in Wood County, the goal is not the vaccine. The goal is to drive our cases down within our communities. And certainly vaccines are a huge tool in helping us to accomplish that goal. Uh, but the guidelines are also really important. So maintaining those and getting our vaccines will give us the best chance to get out of this pandemic and see things begin to recover fully once our cases have been driven down. Yeah, Eric, I don't know if you had anything to add there, but yeah, I know the research is still not in yet as far as whether people can transmit the virus to other people, even though they may be vaccinated. You know, uh, again, Ben's 100% right. You know, we're... we're it's still a very unique virus, and it's a it's a it's a new vaccine. You know, uh, measles, mumps, rubella. We've had decades to study that and understand it. Um, where this, you know, we've only had a, a, really a couple months to think about it uh, and, and how this is going to actually you know affect our community or help our community. So again, more research is needed. We go off what we kind of know about science already and other vaccines, and we're we're assuming that it's going to behave the same way, but we don't know that for sure. Uh, it, it's going to take us, you know, months to figure out some of these questions and if not years for some of these other ones. So it, it's really important, again, to understand you need to get vaccinated, but you also need to take care of all those other uh, interventions that we've talked about so many times before, just to make sure, again, like Ben said, we need to drive these cases down. Because if we don't drive these cases down, we'll continue to have issues with COVID in our community and spikes, if you would. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get down lower, but not low enough. And all of a sudden, you know, in three or four weeks from there, we have another spike, which then hurts our hospitals. And this is just a, a perpetual thing if we do not get our cases down. So far, some, some really good questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, 
we, we, we're going to go one more round uh, for, for each of us as we're kind of running out of time here, about 10 minutes left or so. Uh, but my final question to both of you uh, comes from uh, Bailey Murphy. She lives in Wood County. Uh, and this, this is really pertinent to both of you because in both of your counties, you have a higher education institution, BGSU and UT. So this one's really appropriate for both. But let's start with Ben and then Eric, if you don't mind weighing in. So the question is, although K through 12 educators and staff are beginning to have access to that, to that vaccine, actually just yesterday is when that began, when will educators and staff in higher education be eligible? These students want to be back in person learning as well. That's obviously really important. So Ben, if you could weigh in on that. Yeah, I mean, this goes back to a question we were asked earlier, you know, what, what do we see in future rounds of prioritization? As of right now, we haven't gotten a clear guidance on when the higher education uh, communities will be vaccinated at large. So certainly there may be members of their, of their community that qualify already with, the, with either due to a condition, a medical condition that would make them eligible starting February 15th, or they, they qualify if they're a member of the faculty or staff as uh, based on the age requirements that, that are rolling out. Uh, from week to week. So, you know, we, we, uh, we are, are certainly encouraged by what we've been seeing here at Bowling Green State University. Uh, they have not I, I reported a single transmission of, of uh, COVID within the classroom, they, but they've also committed to doing spacing in the classroom. I think the administration has really demonstrated not only a recognition of, of uh, how to prevent this disease, but also the value that uh, putting kids in the classroom is to those students, not only for the educational experience, but for also the interaction that happens that furthers a higher education experience. So, you know, we're, we're gonna be watching this. Uh, obviously our hope is that everybody gets vaccine as quickly as we can, um, but we have not yet heard uh, any definitive guidance on, on when the higher education uh, community at large will be eligible. So from my perspective with the University of Toledo, uh, I, matter of fact, I was on campus yesterday and I, I saw them testing uh, students and, and athletes. Uh, and I do believe professors as well, too. So I'm really happy and proud of what U University of has been able to do uh, with, again, keeping the cases down, uh, making sure that uh, kids are receiving the education they need. Uh, you know, again, could we do more? Of course. I wish we had, I wish we had vaccine to get to, to those students, to, to get to the professors. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, hard decisions are made in Columbus. Uh, and those, you know, some, sometimes public health wishes that we, we had we had the opportunity to make some of those decisions, but those type of decisions are, um, are hard and I'm glad they're down in Columbus because again, you know, we want to vaccinate as many people right now as we possibly can, but unfortunately with that limited dose, or excuse me, with limited amount of vaccine and, and the doses out there, we just, we just can't vaccinate everybody right now. And, and so, uh, again, everybody needs to just you know be patient. Uh, we do see additional vaccines coming online. Uh, like I said, hopefully April. Uh, I know both Pfizer and Moderna are going to be releasing more vaccines. I think June, July. Uh, and again, I keep on giving this time frame. Fall, uh, we'll really be seeing I think some significant vaccines in our communities. What does that mean? That means that maybe we can get back to a little bit of a, a more normal life like we have pre-COVID. So, again. Patience is what we really we, what we really need right now from everybody, and just understand that we will get vaccines, but it's not going to be in really the next couple months. All right, as far as um, people who have recovered from the virus, so this person, Orville Barnes, uh, how does getting the vaccine make a difference if I'm just getting over a severe case of COVID? Should I be immune anyways right away? So we know there's that 90 day, three month time frame where after you get COVID, you know, you can't pass it, you can't get it. Um, so, you know, what's, what are the recommendations surrounding people who've had COVID, recovered, and now are thinking about this vaccine? Ben, you want to take that? You want me to? Um, I went first last time. I'll throw it to you and I'll follow up. So, all right, a, a couple things. Uh, yeah, we think that, you know, uh, again, antibodies exist for, for 90 days in somebody who's had COVID. But again, um, we've heard that people who had COVID and within a couple of weeks, they get it again. Uh, it, was, it still, was it still in their bodies, if you would, and, and showed up again? So again, more research is needed, but we're looking at 90 days, okay? Uh, you still should be looking at getting the vaccine. I, I would caution you, though, that, uh, again, if you look at CDC websites, uh, they're saying that if you still have symptoms, you really want to talk to your doctor uh, and uh, again, maybe not get the vaccine. But uh, again, I really, I refer a lot of things to the doctors. We don't talk to our doctors enough about ourselves. So every chance I get, whether it's the flu or COVID, talk to your doctor and see that, see what you guys want to do with that vaccine. 
Um, the idea here too is, uh, I, it goes back to what Ben and I talked about. We just don't know enough yet. Uh, and so that's why it's important for you to get vaccinated. Now, if you've had some treatments for COVID, you, you need to take some special precautions. Again, go back to your healthcare professional, your doctor and make sure that, okay, is it okay since I received X treatment that I can get the vaccine? So uh, again, you need to get vaccinated. Everybody will hopefully get vaccinated eventually, but we just need to make sure that you're prepared and you're, you're the right candidate at that point in time to get vaccinated. Yeah, thanks. And just to add to that, Amy, to your point when you started the question, um, there, what, what the research tells us is that it's, it's uh, very unlikely or really uncommon for people to develop additional cases of COVID within 90 days after recovery. And so that's where we talk about this 90 day immunity period. I think the CDC is a little bit reluctant of going quite that far, but they say at least you're less likely to get sick. So that's, you know, that's, that's a pretty good commitment from the CDC, about as good as you can get in, in this day and age. But um, in terms of how we use those vaccines, people do ask sometimes because of that 90 day discussion on the CDC guidance, does that mean I need to, I need to wait for 90 days before I can be vaccinated? And what the guidance really says is that, you know, if you want to further prioritize your vaccines and use that as a way to, to, uh, to provide a greater sense of immunity in the short term, you could, if you just recovered from, from COVID, wait, uh, you know, uh, in the first up to maybe 60 days or so, so that your vaccine immunity picks up where your natural immunity might begin to drop off. So that's something that people can consider. And, and certainly we do see that happening in some jurisdictions. And we, we hear that 90-day that, uh, that uh, period being used that way. But in terms of being a contraindication, does that mean you can't be vaccinated because it's not safe for you? That's not the case. So a person can safely be vaccinated once they have fully recovered from COVID. Uh, just as Eric mentioned, if you have some lingering things or you had some treatments, there may be some additional things you need to run by with your doctor. But if you have confirmed with your doctor, I've, I've fully recovered, I don't have any treatments that, that, that uh, may interfere with an effective response to the vaccine, you can safely be vaccinated. Um, and, and at least here in Wood County, we are not asking that as a, as a triage question as a way, and, and Eric has shaken his head, so neither in Lucas County, as a triage question that would lead you to be deferred for vaccine. If you are ready and recovered and you wanna get it, and even if you're within that 90 day period, we'll give you the vaccine so you can build that uh, vaccine-based immunity as well. Great distinction there, thank you very much. Last question, Brian, you wanna pose? And a viewer wonders, I had a negative reaction to the flu vaccine. Um, is it safe to assume that it will be okay to take this vaccine or should I expect to also have a reaction? So, so I'll jump in here and I'm gonna echo what, what Eric's gonna say is uh, we, it's a good thing to begin that conversation with your provider. So whenever this begins, um, uh, you wanna begin that conversation with, with your provider. There is nothing outright that the CC says you absolutely cannot be vaccinated, but, but your provider want, is, is an important resource to, to weigh into that conversation. So uh, begin the conversation there. If your provider says, you know, I think that it's okay for you to do that, I, I may, may recommend X, Y, or Z precautions be taken in order to get that vaccine, then that's something that can be put into your care plan. If your provider uh, discourages you from doing that, that's good advice to follow. So um, this is new information as we go, but, but we don't wanna make these decisions on our own. And, don't, and, and uh, as an individual, don't put the, the, the poor vaccine clinic operator on the, on the hook either. You know, before you show up to the vaccine clinic, have had this conversation with your provider so that both you and they can confidently pr uh, proceed with your appointment once you've made one. I'll throw it to Eric for anything else. Yeah, yeah, and again, I, I echo what, what Ben just said. Um, you know, what we're seeing too, though, if you've had a severe reaction to a vaccine, your doctor's probably going to really want to talk to you about that. Uh, again, there's there's different levels of reactions to vaccine. You know, was it 30 years ago and you've had vaccine since? So again, there's a lot of questions that you're probably going to want to have your, your, your doctor actually, you know, go through with you to make sure that you can come in and get that vaccine. Um, you know, we... Relative to adverse reactions, you know, the thousands of doses that we've given in the community, I've heard of two uh, really adverse reactions, two adverse reactions out of the 30 some doses that we've given. And, and both one of those was because they, they had a severe reaction um, or allergic reaction to uh, a food, which was interesting. Um, and the other one possibly was because they've had a reaction to a vaccine in the past. So again, that's why it's important for you if you have some issues that you're not quite sure about get a hold of your doctor and really work through those. And just to reiterate, I, I know in, in doing my research that, you know, th it's not necessarily a bad thing if you see just a few folks have these adverse reactions that actually shows that the, the vaccine is working at the efficacy rate that it's supposed to be. If we know that 90, 95%, you know, it's bound to not work and produce some bad effects for some folks, right? 
Yeah, Tyler, as, as Eric mentioned before, you know, the, the, he saw he talked about what he saw among his own staff. What the research tells us is that people may, may experience fatigue, some headaches, maybe a little bit of low grade fever or chills. Uh, you're, they also have some tenderness or soreness at the at the side of the vaccine. But for individuals that that have reactions that are significant enough to interfere with their daily lives, research is telling us it's only about one in 50. And uh, there seem to, seem to be anecdotally maybe a, a, a more of those one in 50 sort of happen at the second dose than the first. At least that's what anecdotally we're hearing. Um, but but you have a chance. You know, we have people here who, ha who got the, their vaccines. And the next day they sort of describe those symptoms. Yeah, I've got a bit of a headache. I'm a little bit tired today. But they went throughout their day. And then there will be other people who say, I'm taking the day. I'm sorry, I'll be in tomorrow. I'm going to recover over the weekend or I'm going to recover until until the next day and just sleep it off. I, I, I have a friend whose wife uh, was vaccinated. She went to work, came home at five o'clock and slept till the next morning. So, you know, there's there's a wide range. But again, this is not not life threatening. It didn't it didn't put it, nothing made her nervous about it. But what it demonstrated was that her body was responding effectively to the vaccine. And on the other side of that, we expect that should she encounter uh, COVID in the real world, that her body's going to be positioned to fight that off. So, yeah, maybe may a little bit of, of momentary discomfort, but weighed against the hospitalizations and the deaths and, and the spread of this within our community. I, it, for me personally, I have not yet had a chance to get my vaccine, but for me personally, it's, it's, a, it's a price that I'm willing to pay. I, and I encourage others to take it on, even if you happen to be one of those one in 50. Yeah, and when you look at it as a whole, it's working exactly how it's supposed to. Gentlemen, I, I really appreciate your time. I know we all do. Uh, we do have to wrap up for uh, and, and say so long for this live Q&A with the Lucas and Wood County Health Commissioners. Really appreciate your time and your effort in trying to get information out to our community, the best information possible uh, in this time when there's so much mis and disinformation. So we really do appreciate it. Uh, since there are so many questions that we've gotten and we didn't get to all of them, we do want to assure you we do plan to do another one of these soon. We don't have an exact date yet, but we assure you we'll do another one soon, whether it's with these gentlemen or other health professionals in our community to help get you answers. Uh, so for Amy Steigerwald and Brian Duggar, I'm Tyler Paley. Thank you so much. Uh, for the news and weather headlines, join us on WTOL 11 at noon. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you.